So, thank you for inviting me here to speak for the Kodak, Kodiak Area Native Association Health Clinic. I'm really thrilled to be able to speak to the healthcare providers who work with the indigenous people of Kodiak Island. So I wanna tell you a little story in the next 50 minutes about integrating culture into healthcare. And to start, I wanna read you a short quote from someone I admire very much, Renee Linklater, who's the Aboriginal coordinator at the Center for Health and Addictions in Toronto. She says, this is a story. It is just one story among a universe of stories told from my perspective. Someone else would tell the story differently. This story takes place on Turtle Island. I'm hesitant in putting the story out there because as Thomas King acknowledges, for once a story is told, it cannot be called back. Once told, it is loose in the world. And so I'm going to start with my story. And just as Renee says, I'm always a little reticent to put it out there because once it's out there, it takes on a life of its own. But here goes. So um, I grew up in southeastern Kentucky, and I write about some aspects of my childhood in my book, Coyote Medicine. But um, my origins are probably not that different from some of the people here on Kodiak Island. I was born in the 50s. Um, my mother, and I'm sure she's listening from wherever she is, so hi, Mom. Um, my mother was one of a group of local women who was paid to dance with visiting soldiers uh, during the Korean conflict. And apparently she did more than dance, because here I am. And um, so my mother had to find a husband because to her incredible credit, she wanted to keep me and she wanted to protect me from the social workers who were taking Native American children away from single mothers in those days. So my mother found a husband. His name was on my birth certificate. I was born Louis Eugene McKinley Jr. Because among the Cherokee, which is my mother's people, we were named for presidents. And McKinley was one of those presidents. In Northern Saskatchewan, where I used to work, they were named for days of the week. And so the most common name was Mercredi, which is Wednesday in French. So, um, so my mother found a husband, Louis Eugene McKinley Sr., good Cherokee fellow. And, um, and she protected me from the social workers. And, and my grandparents who, who raised me, that, that being Cherokee tradition, but also enabling my mother to go to college, which was incredible for our family. My grandfather had no education and my grandmother made it to the third grade. So it was really something for my mother to go to college. And they had to hide the fact that they were taking care of me while she went to college because the social workers would have frowned on that too. So they protected me and nurtured me. And my mother graduated from Berea College in Berea, Kentucky, which is free for Appalachian youth. She quilted her way through college. And we still have some of her quilts that, that she made both during and after that time. So I grew up not really thinking about my identity, it was just me. I was Cherokee. Um, my grandfather participated in some of the ceremonies. Um, my grandmother told the stories. My mother, like many of her generation, tried to be white. In the census in, in, that, in 1960, um, my grandmother was listed as Mexican because apparently it was better to be Mexican than Cherokee in those days. But when my mother found that out in the late 80s, 
she decided she'd rather be Cherokee than Mexican. So prejudice reverses itself depending on the, the epoch of time. So, um, so I was acquainted with the healing practices because I wasn't the healthiest person in the world. I had asthma. And we couldn't really afford doctors. They didn't, there weren't that many anyway. And this was well before um, Medicaid, Medicare. And um, so we had to rely on the traditional healing. And that's what people did. And the traditional healing took place in people's homes. In, in my culture, you went visiting because no, no one had telephones. Um, and so if the curtains were open or if people were on the front porch, then you knew you were welcome. And if the curtains were closed and no one was on the front porch, you knew to just keep walking. And so typically one would come into the house and, and sit down and, at the kitchen table and, and talk for a spell. And then uh, when the talking was done, the healer, whoever that was, would invite the person to, to, would ask them if they wanted to be worked on. And they could be worked on by one or multiple people. They could work on several people at a time. And by work, I mean sing, pray, um, chant, hands-on healing, uh, or just talk, and, and they talked in incredible metaphor in those days, as they still do. So, um, so that's what I thought medicine was. And I decided that I would go to medical school, apparently when I was three years old. My mother says that I told her at age three that I was going to go to Stanford Medical School. I don't know how I even knew what Stanford was, which is proof that the future communicates with the past. Because I did end up going to Stanford Medical School, though several years later, I might add. And, um, and so it happened. And when I got to medical school, I went looking for the class on healing. Was I surprised? I stumbled into pharmacology class where a very famous person who discovered the metabolic syndrome was giving a lecture. And he looked at the class and he said, boys, life is a relentless progression toward death, disease, and decay. The physician's job is to slow the rate of decline. And, and he couldn't admit there were girls in the class, by the way, because there were, um, but he was old school. And it freaked me out. I just was like, no way. Because my great grandmother and my grandmother always said, you should die healthy so you can party on the other side with your relatives. <laughs> and they didn't think you needed to have a disease to die or that um, having a disease would, would cause you to die. They thought that when it was your turn to go, you just go. And so the, the idea was to stay healthy until it was your time to go and then you would go and it would all be good. So I wasn't prepared for, for this new perspective. So I ran over to the Stanford Indian Center, which was in those days in the old firehouse. And I burst through the door and ran up to the desk and there was Henrietta Blue Eyes at the desk. And I said, Henrietta, I need an elder. And she said, what tribe? And I said, Cherokee. And, and she got out her Rolodex, which is now an archaic artifact mm -hmm. of a distant century. And uh, she rolled through it and she said, I've got two. And she gave me their names. One was named Gidla in Ukiah, California. And the other was named Grandfather Roberts in Garberville, California. And so I was visiting Gidla by the next weekend. And really it was my involvement with these elders that, that helped me to survive medical school because the materialism and the lack of spirituality and the lack of relational medicine and the lack of um, community was, was astonishing to me. 
And I remember we had a corner of the student lounge at the medical school where we called it the misfit corner. And there were a bunch of Indians and um, there were some immigrant students, Pakistani, Hindu, um, and, and we had our, our mentor. And um, he is one of the most amazing people in the world. His name is Wise Young, and he's now chair of neuroscience at, at uh, Rutgers University. But he kept, he kept explaining to us how things work. <laughs> and it was through the, the efforts of these elders and Wise that we all got through medical school because he, you know, he helped us to understand the class struggle <laughs> as it related to medical school and how we weren't in the upper class. And, and how to behave in, in, in such a situation. So, um, so I made it through medical school and uh, I've been working with indigenous people ever since graduation. And um, one, of the, one of the exciting things that I did was to learn the hands-on techniques that I received from Gila and Grandfather Roberts. And um, so I studied with some Cherokee healers in Oakland, California, and then later in Tucson, Arizona, and, and learned the techniques by being worked on, and then eventually by working with them on other people. And we discovered, uh, by we I mean, um, my wife and colleague, Barbara Mangi, and our osteopathic colleague, uh, Josie Conti, we discovered that American osteopathy is based upon the hands-on healing techniques of the Cherokee, Shawnee, and Pawnee nations of Missouri and Kansas. Because these are the people from whom Andrew Taylor Still, the father of American osteopathy, developed his craft, learned about anatomy, learned about the muscles, learned about the work of manipulating the body for healing, and became, as, as they called themselves, a lightning bone setter. And it was, it was actually only in, until around 1940 that you were better off to go to an orthopedist than to go to a native lightning bone setter. So um, frontier orthopedics was not very patient friendly. And, um, but that, that's another talk, the indigenous roots of American osteopathy. And it's actually on our website at uh, www.coyoteinstitute.us. And we're continuing to delve more deeply into uh, the origins of osteopathy with these nations. But uh, so that was a really exciting for me to learn those techniques. And then um, in my 30s, I went looking for my father because my parents had broken up when I was relatively young. And I found him in Daytona Beach, Florida, living on the beach in a trailer. And, and I really liked him, but he, he told me, he said, you know, I, I'm afraid I'm, I'm probably not your dad because the timing is wrong. And so he, he humored me and did the DNA testing anyway. And um, he wasn't, which was sad because I really liked him. And um, so then I found two other candidates <laughs> to be my father. <laughs> and I, DNA, I got them to do DNA testing too. And they weren't, they didn't turn out. So then I got back in touch with him. I said, look, three out of three, somebody had to be my father. And he said, all right, I'll tell you. He said, I'm not going to give you his name, except to say um, that he's from Pine Ridge Reservation. And he's Lakota, and he was my best friend. And that was part of why I married your mother. And I said, well, why can't you tell me his name? And he said, because he made me promise that if you came looking for him, that he wouldn't let he, that I wouldn't let you find him, which made me sad. Now, in the year before she died, my mother 
spilled some of the beans and I learned that his name was Frank. So anybody out there from Pine Ridge, if you know Frank who was in the Korean War, give me a call because I'm still looking for him. And um, my mother did visit him in Rapid City and decided that she could never move to South Dakota. So that didn't go anywhere. But in looking for him, I found Sonny Richards. And uh, Sonny was a traditional healer of the Lakota persuasion who had been a policeman in Rapid City for many years and had learned medicine from Frank Foolscrow, who I had the pleasure to meet um, with Sonny when he, when he was very old. No one actually knew how old Frank was because he was so old that no one remembered when he was born. But, um, and that brought me into uh, contact with Lakota traditions and healing methods. So, um, so what I want to say to you guys, the healthcare providers for the indigenous people of the island, is that culture is medicine and that the traditional healing practices can exist side by side with conventional medicine. And there's a concept that I really appreciate called two-eyed seeing. And two-eyed seeing was developed by a Mi'kmaq elder named Albert Marshall. And Albert lives in a, a reserve near Cape Breton, near Sydney, Nova Scotia. And Albert teamed up with a biology professor at Cape Breton University to create a program in integrative science. And the idea is that indigenous knowledge and indigenous ways of knowing are as valid as laboratory scientific knowledge and laboratory scientific ways of knowing. And that the two can coexist. And that we don't need to reduce one to the other or explain one in the terms of the other. They can be equal and different, and people can, can utilize both without having to give up one for the other. Now, uh, one of my favorite, one of my favorite papers that I read, which was co-authored by um, these two individuals, was a paper about the tides in Minas Bay. So if you're a marine scientist, you know that the largest tides in the world are in the Gulf of Maine and particularly around Minas Bay. So the tides are 20 meters and Anchorage claims to have some really big tides, but they're only 10 meters. So we got you beat Anchorage by 10 meters. So, so it turned out that about 3,400 years ago, the people who lived in Minas Bay began telling a story about these huge tides and how they were created. And here's how the story goes. So, um, Glooscap, who's the cultural hero of the Wabanaki people, which are the tribes where I live, the Wabanaki Confederacy in Maine, consists of the Penobscot Nation, two Passamaquoddy Nations, a Maliseet Nation, and a Mi'kmaq Nation. And, and together they're the Wabanaki Confederacy. So for the Wabanaki, um, Creator kind of threw the earth together and it was, you know, not real finished. It was kind of rough. And, and so Creator was too far removed to really fine tune creation or fine tune the earth. So Creator invented Glooscap and sent Glooscap to the earth to kind of fix the rough edges. Glooscap is, is the, fi the Finnish carpenter of creation. And if you ever go to Truro, Nova Scotia, there's about a 20 meter tall statue of Glooscap at the Truro truck stop at the junction of the freeway that takes you 
to Halifax or in the other direction toward Cape Breton Island. And if you get to Cape Breton Island, there's glue scap everywhere. There's the glue scap boat sales and the glue scap restaurant and the list goes on and on. So glue scap is a popular dude. Well, glue scap was kind of big and he needed a place to take a bath. And so he said to Beaver, hey, little dude, would you make a dam across this bay? And Because if you do, it'll be the perfect size for me to take a bath. And Beaver was into it because beavers are engineers and they're always into taking on, you know, complicated projects. And so Beaver built the most marvelous dam that was ever seen across Minas Bay. And what nobody knew was that it was going to anger whale. Whale said, hey, you guys, you just blocked off my food supply. This is one of my favorite eating holes. So take down that dam right away. And Gluskep said, oh, I'm sorry, whale. I didn't mean to do that. I just wanted a bathtub. And so we all said, well, take it down. But Beaver said, no way. I worked really hard to build this dam. I'm not going to take it down. And Whale took matters into his or her own hands, or flippers, as the case may be. And with one giant slap of the whale's tail, that dam broke. That dam disappeared. And, it, and that slap of the whale's tails created the biggest tides the world has ever seen. And that's still true. So now what's the scientific explanation? Well, 3,400 years ago, there was this incredible convergence of, in, of amazing winter runoff with an earthquake, with a hurricane. And, and that ha hasn't happened before or since, as far as anyone knows. And that convergence of weather caused a spit of sand and gravel that was blocking off Minas Bay to disappear. It completely went away, opening the gates for these huge ocean tides to surge in and out. And they've been coming in and out ever since. So both stories are true. And as one elder told us in Australia, whose name was also Albert, he said, there's over 500 creation stories in Australia. They're all different and they're all true. How so? We said after the appropriate pause. He said, well, they're all true for the people who tell them in the place where they're told. And so I don't know how many creation stories there are on Kodiak Island, but they're all true. We're in the place where they're told and for the people who tell them. So um, I also don't know what the traditional healing methods are on Kodiak Island, but I'm quite sure they exist, whether in the shadows or in the open, they're there because Everywhere we go, there's indigenous healing happening in the shadows. Now, uh, when my wife got together, she, and she, she was living in Montreal. And we often met in Burlington, Vermont. And we were stay, we'd stay at the Sheraton Hotel in Burlington, Vermont. And we got really friendly with the doorman because he was a real cool guy. I mean, and it was really fun to talk to him. And, and, and one day he was gone when we, when we went to stay there. And I asked someone else, I, I said, where'd he go? And they said, oh, he went to Haiti. He'll be back in a couple months. We said, what, where'd he go to Haiti for? And they said, I don't know. He goes there every year. So when he got back and we ran into him, we said, hey, we heard you went to Haiti. And he said, yo, mom, I go every year. You know, and, and it turned out that he was a healer, a Haitian healer for the Haitian community in Burlington. And he, he had to go home to refresh his medicine. He had to go home to participate in rituals in Haiti. And then he would come back and his medicine would be strong and it would gradually wear down 
until he had to go back for a recharge. And so we had some amazing conversations with him about Haitian healing. And there he was in the shadow of the University of Vermont College of Medicine, plying his craft, and nobody knew. And the Sheraton was the hotel where UVM had all their medical conferences. Now it's owned by the University of Vermont. But in those days, um, it was a Sheraton. But it was also the UVM Conference Center. So all the continuing education took place in, in where this guy was happily doing Haitian healing. And, and we've seen that all over the world. In, in England, we found all kinds of, of indigenous healers from all of the different continents that the British had invaded. And, and we started calling them the National Stealth Service because they operated in stealth in the shadows of the National Health Service. So I'm gonna guess that in the shadows of this health center, indigenous healing is alive and well, and whether you know it or not. Now, in, in Canada, there are clinics that have traditional healers on staff, and you can, you can schedule time with them through the receptionist. You just walk right up to the, to the desk and say, hey, um, I want to see the traditional healer. And there you go. So one of, one of those places is the Anishinaabe Health Center in downtown Toronto. And what's amazing about Anishinaabe is that they found a way to get around the Toronto fire codes and they actually do revitalization ceremonies in the backyard in downtown Toronto. Some of you know the revitalization ceremony as the sweat lodge ceremony, but we don't call it that anymore because our elders tell us that that's, that was a term invented by the Jesuits. And the proper term is Inipikaga in Lakota. And the best translation is revitalization ceremony. But they found a way to heat their rocks to, to make things hot in downtown Toronto with a beehive oven, which is amazing. And also in Thunder Bay, Ontario, there's a health center that, that is exactly like this. And it's built as a circle. It's a circular building with an internal area for ceremony. And so these things are um, appearing all over North America. There's, there's University of Manitoba has an Aboriginal health unit in downtown Winnipeg that has a ceremonial space called the Thunderbird House. And so um, this idea of bringing traditional healers into healthcare is happening. And, um, you know, and, and it's a wonderful thing because it's a way to counteract trauma. And so um, trauma is huge in the lives of indigenous people. Because once upon a time, this land was all ours, only nobody owned it. And because nobody had this idea that you could own land. I mean, people had this idea of nations having their territories. And sometimes people fought over territory. But this notion of individual ownership of land was foreign. And, and, and I'm, not going, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the trauma that happened because everybody knows that all too well. But I, I just want to read another little quote from Renee Linklater, um, who wrote a marvelous book about decolonizing trauma. And uh, Renee says, trauma has created a climate of systematic oppression, violence, and abuse. Pre-colonial trauma was predictable and consistently set in a cultural context. And its context revolved around death, tribal wars, starvation, separation, etc. In contemporary times, 
Trauma takes the forms of sexual abuse, rape, psychological assaults, accidents, environmental disasters, wars, and holocausts. And she goes on to talk about the trauma caused from mass, mass deaths, which was from foreign diseases. So the viral illnesses brought by the Europeans and the Russians to North America, for instance, and the trauma caused by the loss of land and resources through relocation and treaties. And of course, the residential boarding schools and the child welfare system, which to my mother's incredible credit, she protected me from. So, um, so people cope with trauma in different ways. And um, people cope with trauma by drinking too much. They cope with trauma by gambling too much. They cope with trauma by engaging in other risky behaviors. They cope with trauma through using drugs, um, they cope with trauma through not taking care of themselves. And, and some people rebel and, and cope with trauma by returning to culture, by regaining the language, the cultural practices, the healing practices, and strengthening them and teaching them to the youth and openly displaying them, which we're now able to do. And you know, it wasn't until 1978 in the United States that it was legal for Native people to do ceremony. So the first revitalization ceremony that I attended um, was illegal. And to his amazing credit, there was a Catholic priest there and, and he said he went to every ceremony on the reservation and he brought his collar so that if the, if the police showed up, he would put on his collar and declare that this was a proper Catholic rite going on and they should get, a, get away, go away, it's proper Catholic. Look, I'm a priest, I have a collar. And his name was Father Stone and he was a really fun guy and he, he confided in me, he said, you know, he said, Look, he said, I go to all their ceremonies and they go and they come to all mine. And he said, I got an award for having the most Indians in, in church of any priest around. And he said, but really between you and me, I prefer their ceremonies. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and one, of the, one of the interesting aspects of, of this, there was a, a, there was a religion invented by native people in the late, 1800s um, called Native American Church. And um, it's an amalgam of Northern Cheyenne, uh, Shoshone, and I believe Winnebago, but it might be Paiute practices um, with a little Jesus thrown in. And, um, but the ceremony was designed so that if the police showed up, that every single object used in the ceremony could be turned into a cooking utensil and the people could pretend that they were just together all night in a teepee cooking and, and um, hanging out with each other. So, um, so it was really traumatic that, that all of these things had to be kept secret. Though the Lakota Sundance made a comeback during World War II because the government thought but the purpose of the Sundance was to prepare men to go off to war. Actually, the purpose of the Sundance was really to celebrate people coming back from war and having survived it. But, but the government didn't need to know that. And so the Sundance became practiced, was able to be practiced starting in 1940 in South Dakota because of, the, of World War II. So, um, so what I want to encourage all of you to do is, is to be curious. And we're not used to being curious in medicine. We think we know all the answers. And if you've been in medicine as long as I have, you know that the answers change every couple years. 
And what was incredibly proper in 1980 is incredibly bad in 2019. And so I have to take all of our pronouncement of fact with a grain of salt. I remember once upon a time, you know, whenever a baby was born with meconium in the amniotic fluid, we would intubate them and suck it out. And I used to say, this can't be right. There's something wrong with this. And I was always told, you're stupid. Of course this is right. This is what we do. And somebody did a, did a big study and found out it was bad for the babies to do that. And it was better not to. Wow, who knew? And now we pretend that we never did that. So um, there's so many things that are going to turn out that way, I think. Um, I'm on a personal campaign against proton pump inhibitors because they're only FDA approved for six weeks. And I see patients that have been on them for 20 years. And I don't know if, if people here know this, but you can treat hemochromatosis with a proton pump inhibitor. That's how effective it is in blocking the absorption of iron. Not to mention manganese, cobalt, zinc, magnesium, and all those other things that apparently the human body needs. So, um, so we're not always right. So why not ask the locals, hey, how do you guys deal with such and such? You know, and, and, and if you run into an answer like what an elder I know gave in, at a conference in, in uh, Alberta, don't be surprised. So a nurse in the audience asked him, she said, hey, how do you treat arthritis? And he said, I don't know her. Why don't you bring her around tomorrow and I'll, and I'll let you know. And so he was making the point, somewhat tongue in cheek, that indigenous healing treats people and not allopathic categories of disease. So, um, so in Lakota tradition, there's the medicine circle. I don't know if it exists in Alaska, but um, we have the four directions. And the ultimate circle is the horizon. And so we think about um, the four directions as metaphors. So the east is a metaphor for the spiritual body or for spiritual healing. The south is a metaphor for emotional healing and for relationship healing. The west is a metaphor for physical healing. The north is a metaphor for cognitive healing, for healing the mind and the community. <clears throat> and then what every horizon is, is actually a sphere. Because if you look up, you look into the sky, and if you look down, you look into the earth. And so the sky is a metaphor for protection, which the sky does. It keeps the rocks from falling on our heads, thanks to the atmosphere. Keeps the solar flares from burning us up. Keeps the solar radiation out. Um, hopefully we won't destroy it, because we won't do so well if we do. Well, if we lose our protection, we're in big trouble. And of course, the earth feeds us and nurtures us. All that we are comes from the earth. And so the earth provides us with nurturing and healing. And so in Lakota world, we try to balance the emotions, spirituality, physicality, thinking, mind, community, relationships, um, protection and nurturing. And if we can be in the middle of all those things, we're in what's called Wicho Zani, which Zani means healing, and Wicho is a, kind of means all of it. And together the word refers to balance, that you're in balance. And if you're out of balance, it's called Tawakalpta, which literally means one's head on its side. And it's pretty hard to walk around with your head on its side. So 
so it's it's the notion of um, healing takes the form of figuring out how someone is out of balance in the context of their family and community and helping them to restore balance. Whether that means giving up Red Bull or um, drinking less or repairing broken relationships or um, taking herbal medicine, uh, whatever that means, that's what it is. So, um, how much time do I have left anyway, you guys out there in the audience? Yeah. All right, I'll just keep, keep talking. Keep talking. <laughs> Everyone's happy. Everyone's happy. I got everyone hypnotized. <laughs> so I'll just, I'll just be happy to keep going. So what I'm saying is ask people how, how the locals treat these particular kinds of problems or how a local would, would approach this person who, who needs help. And, and perhaps even consider being open to identifying the locals who the community recognizes as having healing abilities and, and getting to know them and, and finding out what they do, hanging out with them, watching them work, um, maybe even bringing them into the clinic to work. And, and this will put you, this will help you to catch up to Canada, which everyone wants to do. <laughs> no one wants Canada to win the Olympics in the United States. So, um, and it also is a way to undo colonization, to decolonize healthcare, which is what Renee Linkletter talks about in her awesome book. And so much of the healthcare that's delivered to indigenous people is top down. And, and so much of it is designed from afar without the involvement of the local community in, in figuring out um, what it is that the community needs. So I did a study in Saskatchewan where I interviewed 851 Aboriginal people in, in a whole series of focus groups about their feelings about the healthcare services that they were being offered. Um, and almost everyone remarked on how nobody asked them, no, nobody asked for their input. Nobody asked them, well, what do you want in your healthcare? Instead, they got a biomedical individualistic model and which minimized the importance of community and culture in preference to biology and genetics. And they, they believed that this model actually did harm to them and to their culture. And, and they, they, many reported that their healthcare providers had distinctly different values from them. And that the most common value difference mentioned was the lack of respect for elders. I noticed that there are elder parking spaces in, in, the, in the parking lot outside, which shows, of course, respect. And so probably um, that's not a problem with you guys, but it can be a problem for people that are brought in from away to provide healthcare who haven't really been immersed in the culture. And um, a Dine researcher named Benton Benai found seven virtues, virtues that seem to be relatively universally endorsed by elders. And um, for, for um, Benton Benai, these were love, respect, wisdom, bravery, honesty, humility, and truth. And, and in my study, people talked about how, um, what was lacking from the services they were receiving was a commitment to relationships and community. And they thought that the Privacy Act, which is equivalent to HIPAA in Canada, 
was ridiculous since everybody knew everybody's business anyway. So why pretend that nobody knew what was going on? And just let the whole community come into the office with the person who was ill. And in, in the traditions in which I was brought up, people who are sick take on that illness for the community because illness in one member of the community means that the whole community is out of balance. And, and we should thank the person who's ill because if they weren't sick, we would be because they took it on for us. And so therefore, we all have the responsibility to help them get well. In, in Diné communities in Northern Arizona and New Mexico, that means everybody has the responsibility to contribute money and resources to the ceremonies that are put on to help people get well, like the Blessing Way and the Coyote Way and, and all of the other ceremonies, most of which I don't understand because I'm not of that culture. But, um, but I understand the idea that everyone has a duty to contribute. So, um, so bringing community, family, and relationship into healthcare is really important. And what I like to do is to ask people to bring everybody they know into the next appointment. My record is 57 people. I dare you to beat my record. Now we used to do this at, at five o'clock in, in the clinic where I worked after everyone else had gone home because we needed a really big space for people to bring everyone they knew, they knew. And what I would do is, is a talking circle and we would go around the circle and everybody would contribute in order their thoughts about what was the matter with this person? How come they were sick? How did they come to be sick? And then the next pass around the circle, they would contribute their thoughts about how do, how do you think this person could get better? How could they get healthier? And the third pass, I would ask them, what are you willing to do to help this person get better? What are you willing to contribute? And, and it was just a marvelous experience. I remember once um, one of the women elders was telling another woman how some, you know, how prayer works, but sometimes not as quickly as we want it to. And she said that she had a daughter who'd been addicted and she'd been praying for 20 years and finally prayers were answered and her daughter stopped being addicted. He said, so, you know, you just have to be patient sometimes. But don't give up, because it really works. And um, I remember another situation where um, the patient never came back. But the group, a group of 20 people, wanted to continue meeting. <laughs> and they, they kept planning interventions for the patient, to his chagrin. And, and they eventually got him off opiates and got him working full time. And and he never stopped being angry at them, but he sure did function better. Apparently he was just as grumpy as he ever was. They didn't care that. But, um, so bringing, um, bringing the community into healthcare was, was really effective. And we, we did a study also in Saskatchewan where we did um, talking circles in the waiting room after hours. And we had, a, we had over a thousand people come and we had about 450 who came at least four times and filled out pre and post symptom questionnaires. And we found out that coming to a talking circle four times or more was as powerful as visiting the doctor and oftentimes more powerful for mental health problems. And, um, and it was free. It didn't cost anything. They were run by elders who were happy to do them. Now, personally, I think that health service, I think Health Canada should have given them a stipend, but that was above my pay grade. And, um, 
it was really awesome. So I just want to invite you to play with and to speak with people in the community and to ask people, how do we bring culture more into healthcare? And perhaps you could do a series of talking circles where people come and contribute their thoughts to how this could be done and what it should look like because someone knows and they're out there. They just may not believe that they're welcome to speak their piece. And um, we've seen that in at least one community in the Yukon where um, the traditional healers didn't feel like they could come into the health center and, and really talk openly about what they do. So again, it was a national stealth service affair. And, and part of our consultation was to try to get people talking openly in a circle about how things worked and, and what people did. So I have to be running out of time. So I'm just gonna finish with one more study that we did with uh, traditional elders. Because we, we wanted to ask them, um, so what should mental health workers know to work in indigenous communities? And um, so we gave them tobacco and, 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 or prayer ties or, or cloth and, and sat with them and um, got their thoughts and kept going back and forth with them until we reached a consensus. And the, fir the first thing that everyone agreed on is the importance of listening. That you have to teach people from the dominant culture how to listen. It was Jacques Lacan, the French psychoanalyst, who said that the greatest gift you can give someone is to listen without judgment or interpretation. The average physician in one study listened for 18 seconds before interrupting. And it was found that if you could get the physician to listen for 24 seconds, that what are called doorknob complaints dropped by 37%. This doorknob complaint is when you're walking out the door and the patient says, oh, by the way, doc, I've been having some crushing chest pain every now and then. <laughs> That'll bring you back in the room. Mm -hmm. and, and also that you have to teach people how to pause. Because in some parts of the United States, people don't pause. They talk on top of each other. And it's common in some indigenous communities to have long pauses. When, when Barbara first met my brother, she couldn't believe that one human being could talk so slowly and could pause for so long between sentences. But he could. <coughs> the, the second thing they said that people needed to know is that no one exists apart from their relationships. And if you want to understand someone, look to their relationships. And in, in family medicine, we try and teach residents to use the genogram to do this. And it turned out, a, we did a study with a colleague in the United Kingdom where um, people with mental health problems got six half hour problem solving visits primarily focused on how to better deal with their conflictual relationships. And our colleague got an award from the National Health Service for cutting costs. Because these after the six visits, these people came to the surgery so much less often than before. So relationships. Third, they said, you know, you can't tell people what to do. They never listen. No matter how smart you are, give it up. People have to come up with their own solutions. 
You can tell them to stop smoking till you're blue in the face, and they won't. They have to want it. So just stop telling people what to do and find out what they're willing to do or what they want to do. Of course, nowadays we call that motivational interviewing and ACT. Um, and finally, they, they, they disputed um, bringing capitalism into healthcare. They said this, this system of greed has no place here. That this system of making money on people's misery is just not right. And, and people, you know, people, young people, they deserve to make a living, but they shouldn't be profiting on people's misery. And they said, and, and don't send us those burnout folks. We want people who are passionate about what they do, who love what they do, and, and, and do it from the heart. And, and, don't, and, and don't send us politicians either. <laughs> we don't like them. Keep them down south. And, and they said, and, and, and teach these people the importance of faith, hope, and the power of intent. And, and um, it seems to be so important. And they said, and, and they need to know that their job is not to treat people, but to empower them and to empower them in the context of community and tell them to stop telling people what's gonna to happen to them. Nobody knows what's gonna to happen to them. Stop telling them how much time they've got to live or that they're only gonna get sicker. Stop telling them, you know, tell them that nobody knows and that all we can do is do what we can do. And, and if they're really serious, they better do everything they can do and we'll do everything we can do and we'll see what happens. And finally, they all agreed that ultimately, all healing is spiritual healing. That, that the power of healing comes from the spirit dimension. And that we should never forget that. And in the, in the cultures to which I understand, we talk about um, people who do this kind of work as being hollow bones, that the, that the power of healing flows through you from the spiritual dimension into the physical dimension, and that the job of the person helping another person is to create a safe space for the medicine and not to be egotistical and say, oh, I'm a great healer, or any of that, but to say, I don't do anything. I'm just a hollow bone. And we can do with a little more of that in conventional medicine, in my opinion. But um, that's probably enough. I've rattled my mouth long enough. And um, we'll, we'll stop the recording and we'll have some time for questions and, and uh, responses. And that's all, folks. <laughs>